Today on the show, we have your early July fishing reports for Lake of the Ozarks, Table Rock Lake, and Truman Lake. Plus, all the way from Sarcoxy, Missouri, Jeremy Lawyer joins the show to talk about finding success as a tournament fisherman and to share some tips to help you catch more fish this July. It's the Tackle HD Podcast. Let's get it started with your early July fishing report for Lake of the Ozarks. What's going on, everybody? Uh, this is Jack Uxa with the Lake of the Ozarks Fishing Report for early July. Um, fishing's been good. Um, it's the time of year where the fish are really feeding. You know, boat traffic, you know, really lately it hasn't been too bad. Um, still busy on the weekends, you know, but during the week it's been pretty darn nice. Catching some good bass, catching good numbers of bass. Um, not to say every day is a slam dunk, it's still a, a, you know, it's, you know, still weather dependent, but for the most part we've been catching them. Yet this morning was a, another good example of just a solid morning. Uh, started off at 7 a.m. You know, first spot we went to, we caught quite a few. Uh, we started off with a top water. Um, you know, this morning the top water wasn't that great, but generally speaking, the top water has been pretty awesome. And really, we've been catching them on a variety of top waters too. Uh, Berkeley Chapo has been great. Um, you know, various you know baits that'll walk the dog, like a Zara Spook or a Jay Walker 120. Uh, it's got the three treble hooks, and it's a little bit bigger bait, so you can cast a little extra far, far you know, further than the normal top water, and, and walk that dog back and forth. And that's been a lot of fun. Uh, who doesn't like catching them on top waters too? And uh, so we started off. Uh, throwing top waters, it wasn't working that good. We picked up a little shaky head worm. Um, this one's the needle worm in the June bug color. It's pretty much the only color I've really tried lately. It's been awesome. Uh, we knew the fish were on this one spot. A lot of people have been hitting it, so maybe that's why they weren't weren't eating the top water. But we got them biting on that that shaky head, and that was fun. Um, a little bit later on in the day. Uh, you know, they were, we were fishing points and we were fishing brush. You know, a lot of stuff is on the main channel. Um, the current here on Lake of the Ozarks is starting to, uh, taper off, not be as consistent as it was, as it was for the last month or so. And, uh, fish are still feeding. I mean, it's still, still good morning. Um, you know, caught, caught some three and four pounders, which is always a lot of fun, you know, catching, catching some good ones. Uh. That's always kind of like the, the hard part of it. You know, yesterday we caught a lot of fish. We caught a lot of keepers. We didn't catch anything in the three and the four pound range. But, uh, you know, it's summertime. Yesterday we had a little front. And uh, today we're starting to move away from the front. It's still pretty nice out here. I'm fixing to start another guide trip here in a couple hours. And, you know, man, it, it's, it feels pretty great for, for this time of year. You know how it is in Missouri. It can be pretty hot and 100 degrees. And so I'm pretty thankful for this right now in the shade and got a little breeze and you know that that is one of the problems that we had, we ran into yesterday for a little bit it was just super bright and sunny with no wind and it was pretty tough fishing and then as soon as that wind started blowing a little bit man those fish started feeding um down by the dam uh by bagnell dam i'm talking about there's a, there's a there's a whole lot of little baby shad and you can see them uh, you can see the fish busting on them you'll be just driving down the middle part of the lake and all of a sudden there's just a little cluster of fish popping on the surface and um you know the, the shad you really gotta watch for because they're pretty tiny and, and every now and then you'll catch a bass and they'll throw up some little baby shad and they'll they're just itsy bitsy i mean they're not even an inch long so they're they're kind of hard to mimic right now but the white bass the bluegills the largemouth they're all they're all taking advantage of these shad of this shad hatch now that shad hatch is not going on throughout the lake and you don't need to go target that if you want to it's there but like i said i caught a lot of fish yesterday I didn't catch as many big fish as i did today and today i was in more of the mid lake section um today we caught them on a 12 inch worm uh once again going in the brush uh and and on the points but the brush pile bite is starting to pick up and that's that's something you can expect just about every july here on lake of the ozarks um I've got 20 pound fluorocarbon here, a 7 foot 3 medium heavy action rod. Um, hog monster, once again, that June bug color, that'll work. Um, I also have got a drop shot here rigged up. 
Um, this is on a new Veritas rod I just got in, seven foot medium action, uh, 20 pound braid, and then a 10 pound monofilament leader. And um, this is also a needle worm in a little different color. I know it looks huge there on the screen, but it's it it's hard to categorize categorize this as a finesse worm because it's it's an eight inch worm. It's a good sized worm, but it's it's long and slender, and it, it's been working for drop shot fish. Um, a lot of times we'll throw that in an area that we already threw some other baits in, and you know we'll find ourselves kind of staying there for a little bit longer picking off some extra fish and and sometimes you catch your biggest fish on that i mean that's kind of remarkable a little bait um i'm not working it that slow either I'm, I'm i'm wiggling it quite a bit down there um and then every now and then you just even in the middle part of the day you know pick up that top water again this this one's great because this one's uh, hopefully you can see this it's been just chewed up if you really can see it there's actually water in this thing it's been it's been beaten up so bad uh we have been tying into some white bass and some hybrids and stuff too lately which is you know they're a lot of fun they they're like little crackheads down there they run around so fast and they feed so furiously and then all of a sudden they're gone for forever um you know speaking of other fish man we've we've tied into some catfish lately We've gotten some walleye lately, which walleye on Lake of the Ozarks is really rare. Um, but they've been fairly consistent lately. Um, you know, as, cons as consistent as they'll ever get, you know, catching like three a week. <laughs> so it's not, not all the time, but at least it's something. But it's been good. And, you know, this is the time of year that, uh, you know, fish are feeding. There's a lot of people out there. So, you know, I'm doing a lot of short trips, a lot of morning trips, a lot of evening trips. You can catch them during the middle part of the day too, but you know, I've been trying to uh, capitalize on those 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 feeding windows uh, and also those less boat traffic. Ones. So um, be careful this Fourth of July; it's coming up. There's going to be some drunks out there. There's going to be a lot of people out there that have never driven a boat. There's probably going to be some idiot out there driving through somebody else's dock. You know, they. They don't know how to handle their boat, so they just drive it through a dock or a bluff or something like that. So be careful. Um, Got to watch out for them guys. But it's it's way easier fishing now than it is a lot of other times of the year. Um, tournament numbers, you know, what tournaments we've been having, they've been pretty good. Uh, a lot of the tournaments we've been having, probably seven, eight a week. You know, not not a crazy number. Um, they've been smaller in, in in general, and people have been catching them. Uh, you got to have some. You know, you gotta have several four and five pounders to win, really. Uh, so, shoot, that's 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 fun. You know, really, it's it's. it's I don't have any time to fish any tournaments this time of year. Uh, we just did a, a wired to fish uh, video yesterday, so look out for that. Wired to fish will have it out coming uh, probably in the next couple weeks. We we're primarily talking about crappie fishing, which, to be honest with you guys, I love to crappie fish. I don't love to crappie fish in July. It's not the time of year for it. We caught some, we made it work, um, you know, yeah, but in the cooler months of the year, talking, you know, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May even, uh, I love to talk about crappie. June, July, I'd much rather talk about everything else, really. Um, you put a bunch of crappie in the live well this time of year, they don't, they don't last long, and they're just not as good to eat, and they're not as much fun to catch. So, you know, now catfish, shoot, I've been doing some catfish trips lately. You know, they've, they've been fun. Um, you know, they stretch a string. And, you know, the other thing about catfish is anybody can catch them. You know, you don't need to be uh, this great fisherman come in with a bunch of experience to, to catch a bunch of catfish. And, um, you know, plus, you know, some people, you know, it's not really considered fishing unless you're bringing home some, some fish to eat. So... So there you go, white bass and catfish have at it, and, and they're biting good right now. So continue to look for the, the current flow to slow down. Um, you know, we'll still have some good fishing. They will kind of, eventually they'll go, the fish will actually rise up in the water column. Right now I'm catching a lot of them, you know, 10 to 15 feet of water. Um, eventually, as the current, you know, really slows down and, you know, the fish get used to that, the bait fish will come up in the water column, will have more of a thermocline, and it rises the fish up off the bottom. And so the bass will chase 
chase those shad then. Uh, right now, most of the shad we're seeing are, are deeper, at least that's where we're catching the bass. And um, concentrate on your brush piles. Forward facing sonar is always helpful. Um, you know, get your net out too, man. I, I tell you, there's been a few bass lately that the only reason we caught them is because we were quick with the net. Um, we're using heavier weights now, heavier baits and, and heavier weights. And so they tend to, you know, they tend to throw those baits. So if you're, if you got somebody else in your boat with you, get that net out. You know, that, that tackle HD net has been awfully helpful because it's got a little bit smaller of a, a, a rubberized net. And so your, your, your lures don't get hung up in it as bad as some other nets. And it's a smaller net too. So it's a little quicker. Um, a lot of times when I'm doing a lot of crappie trips, I like a bigger net because I can put a whole lot of crappie in it, you know, put 30 or 40 crappie in it. But this time of year, I'm not doing as many crappie trips and that net doesn't get tangled up nearly as bad as a lot of other nets. So it's, that's been pretty handy. And, and I find myself using it a little bit more because if I've got a other, you know, like older style nets, you know, you're going to have to kind of dig your lures out and dig the tangle out and that kind of stuff. This net's a little smaller. It's not as deep. It doesn't hold as much, but you can still put a big old catfish in it. And, you know, like I said, you're not going to have as many tangles. So if you're looking for a net, check out the Tackle HD net. Check out their, their 12 inch big old hog monster worm. Um, June bug has been great for me. Um, you know, but really it's about the only color I've been trying. Uh, it's been catching them. So it's, it, water clarity in general has cleared off. And um, it's just been good fishing. So get out there, uh, be careful of your surroundings, catch a lot of fish. You know, mornings, evenings have been the best. It's typical summertime. Uh, we're gonna be in this pattern for a while, so it, it's a good thing. It's it's a good time of year to get out there and just uh, just lean back on some. I, I will say this too: set the hook hard. Um, I get a lot of customers that, you know, like I said, we've been missing some fish. Uh, use this seven foot three medium heavy rod to jack them and i'm using pretty heavy line right now too so have me catching some fish on a jigging spoon too that's been fun uh but good luck everybody now we throw it over to matt fielder for this week's look at table rock lake hey guys this is matt fielder with mjf guide service and modern outdoor tackle giving giving you your Beginning of July fishing report for Table Rock Lake presented by Tackle HD. The water temperature is around 84 degrees. Um, if we have a really hot day, it'll get up into the, you know, 87, 88. I've even seen it as high as 89, especially up the river. Um, so the water temperature has been climbing um, on today's trip. It was only about 83, 84, but it was also cooler day to day. Um, they haven't been running as much current lately. So in the rivers, you're starting to see a little bit of a thermocline, actually a lot of bit of a thermocline, especially up to James. Um, I saw a little bit today in the white, um, a little bit of a thermocline in some creeks in the white river. So um, think about that when you're going into the, into the rivers. Um, I haven't seen too much of a thermocline as of yet on the main lake, meaning the dam or Kimberling City. Um, the lower White River, the lower James River, I haven't seen a, a thermocline there yet. So uh, keep that in mind when you're fishing. Um, another thing is the lake level is 916. Um, that is about a foot low for normal summer pool. Um, so the fish are offshore like always. So they're kind of out of the bushes. I mean, there's a little bit of a topwater bite in the morning or a little bit of a glide bait bite in the morning if you want to go up shallow. Um, but then those fish really pull off deep. Um, if you're a bottom bouncing person, um, the Wobblehead paired up with the Zumo Monster, our favorite color, you know, has been the Plum, Plum Apple has been my go-to. Um, and the guys at the shop say the same thing. So uh, Plum Apple, I also like a green pumpkin or something really natural. Um, on the Wobblehead, um, I've been throwing either a, a half ounce if I'm 30 foot and under, and if I'm 30 foot plus, then I'll throw that three quarter ounce on the wobblehead and the big worm. Um, try to fish the big worm kind of somewhere, you know, where there's, 
you know, current running up to a long pea gravel point or, you know, whatever your favorite structure is. I mean, you can even drag this thing around some timber as well and it'll get some bites. Um, but with that being said, a lot of the fish are suspended right now. They're not really running any water, so it's not causing these fish to really plant down on the bottom. Yes, you can catch them on the bottom, but a lot of these fish are suspended because they're not running water. A great way to catch those fish is throwing a drop shot. Um, I like to throw the finesse slammer or you know the hot shot minnow by X zone. You can throw a robo worm that's been working really good on the robo worm. I've been throwing Aaron's Magic. On this uh, egg zone, I've been throwing the 309 color. It's really natural. It's got a little bit of green pumpkin, but it's also translucent. It's got a little bit of purple. And if you know all about our table rock fish, they love purple. So really good bait. You may want to check them out. Um, another great way to catch those same fish is throwing a slab spoon. Um, you just find a school of fish while you're graphing. Um, if you don't have live scope, you can see where they're at on your 2D, um, go to a place that you see the fish at, take a black marker, mark up your line um, to where they are sitting. You can do that by going to the depth that you saw them in suspended, drawing that line once that bait hits the bottom and you should be putting it in there every time. Another great way to catch those fish that are suspended or even if they are on the bottom um, is, a, is a swim bait. So you can either use the Tackle HD swimmer or I like throwing you know this 3.8 divine swim bait as well. Um, the reason why I went to a 3.8, if you've listened to me earlier, I've been throwing a lot of 2.8, sometimes a little 3.3, but right now, it's the summertime, they seem to be wanting a little bit bigger bait. So the 3.3 and the 3.8 have been a big, big thing for me. So upsize your bait a little bit more. You may think that you're not gonna get as many bites, but they're, they're wanting a little bit bigger profile and a little bit bigger meal. Um, so upsize your swim bait just a tad and you'll get some bites. And you may get some really quality bites to go along with it. Another bait that is really popular over the summer, if you can find them on the bottom, or even if they're not on the bottom, they're suspended over cover or over treetops even, um, you can throw a 6XD. It's a really great bait. The profile is, you know, just about the right size for table rock. And just try to get it as deep as you can and, and uh, throw it on, you know, 12-pound test fluorocarbon and try to cast it as far as you can. The, the length of the cast is really, really, really crucial um, for this time of the year. So there's a a smorgasbord of baits that you can throw this time of the year, especially right now, early July, that you can get a lot of bites on Table Rock. So until next time, thanks for watching. Now with your Truman-like report, here's Dave McCormick. Well, welcome back. It's your July fishing report, Truman Lake. Well, it's finally down. I mean, we've been flooding all spring and it's been making me crazy. So I've been waiting for this, to be honest. The waters to clear up, the current to stop, and the fish to just move around and do what they normally do, chase shad, suspend in the trees, get in the brush piles. Those are my two favorite summertime things and that's what's gonna start really. I like to ledge fish too. And we have some ledges, some humps, some ridges, things that most people don't think about when they go to Truman Lake, but we do have some of that stuff too. So that's my favorite way to fish. And when I'm around fishing those brush piles or ledges, I love a football jig. Anybody that watches my, my videos knows. And I'll make a weight change. This time of year, I'll go to a three quarter. Three quarter ounce jig falls harder, thumps the bottom harder, makes them make a reaction quicker. Everything happens in the warm water a little faster, obviously, than it does when it's cold. Let's talk about my second favorite way to fish at Truman Lake. So it's out there in the trees, it's just about to happen. It, it just goes on from now until say September, even October. I've heard some stories of November spinnerbait fishing out in the trees, but I can't say I've done it. I like a big worm, I know. Uh, the same thing I'll throw in a brush pile. Uh, I might throw on a little lighter weight, like a 5 16 ounce, or maybe 3 8 Texas rig worm. And here's the key, I think, in doing it right is when you pull up to the tree, don't get too close to it. 
and put the worm on the back side, the opposite side from you, and take big three big pulls off your reel and then engage immediately engage your reel. That's not gonna let that bait down much more than four or five foot. And you'll generally get and kind of hang it on the tree. We even sometimes hop it up and down. And then if we don't, maybe we think they're a little deeper because we saw them on the electronics, we'll drop it down maybe six or seven feet. But generally if they're suspended, it's right around the thermocline. And if you jumped in the water, that's what makes your feet feel real cold. And I'm gonna bet that it's probably around four or five feet at trim. It doesn't get deep like it does at some of these real clear bodies of water. So my second favorite way when they're in those trees is to crank them, is to square bill them. Um, sometimes a shad pattern, sometimes a brim pattern, sometimes it just doesn't matter. I'll tell you what though, gang, do put your favorite crankbait on heavy line, 20 pound line. You say, why Dave, that's, that's, that's too heavy. It's really not. We have the men in the striped suits on this lake. And if you're fond of your favorite bass lure and you don't have it on and you hook into a 10, 15, maybe 20 pound hybrid, um, they tend to steal that stuff. So put it on 20 pound line. It'll keep it from going too deep too. I know that's crazy, but when you're out there around those trees, you don't want it to go too deep. I even run my, my say my Bagley's DB3 is another crankbait I'll throw in those trees on heavy line and kind of do what we call crash it and uh, not get it hung up in the tree. And sometimes when it pops off the tree, that's when they get it. So um, those are my two favorite ways to fish, especially in July, August or September, actually. Uh, hopefully we don't have more flooding, but if the water stays stable and uh, stays warm and we don't have current, that's what's gonna happen. Take a kid fishing, keep hydrated, it's warm. So drink your Gatorade, your water, take a kid fishing, it makes a difference. Next time, check me out on YouTube, Fish 30, 106 tournament videos. I'm sure, and probably half of them are at Truman Lake. Check me out. All right, Jeremy Lawyer, welcome to the Tackle HD podcast. Well, I'll tell you what, I appreciate you guys having me. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's an honor to have you here. I've been doing my research on you this week, and um, let, let's see how accurate this this paragraph I found from MajorLeagueFishing.com is. It says, uh, an all-around outdoorsman, Jeremy Lawyer, has caught about every fish that lives within 100 miles of Sarcoxy, Missouri. The winner of the 2019 Pro Circuit event on Grand Lake, a 2018 Toyota Series event at Lake of the Ozarks, and a 2016 Phoenix Bass Fishing League All-American on Lake Barkley. Lawyer has impressed at every level available to him. Jeremy has also won the uh, La Russell Squirrel Tournament three times. <laughs> so that is, are we up to date and everything there is accurate? I think I think you pretty well covered everything. That pretty well got it. The old squirrel just topped it off. So, cool. but yeah, we, we have a good time. We try to make a competition out of everything. Um, so tell me something about uh, Sarcoxy, Missouri, where you happen to live and, and you also work, you know, when you're not fishing as the city administrator there. I'm in Missouri myself. I am not familiar with Sarcoxy. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, we're a small town, but, uh, you know, we got a lot of heart. There's a lot of a lot of places that have a little bit of a reputation, and we've got one as well. You know, we're the peony capital of the world, and then we're also the strawberry capital of Missouri. So, you know, there's been a lot of uh, cuts and bruises around Sarcoxy, people trying to earn a living. So it's been, uh -huh. it's been really good, though. It's a good, small, quiet town, and, and everybody knows everybody. Have you been there your whole life? Uh, a good portion of it, yes. We've had four generations of lawyers here at town, and, and uh, it's, it's been a good place to live and proud to say I'm from Sarcoxy. Wonderful. Um, so I read that you did your first bass fishing tournament at 12 years old. Yeah, you know, my I, I was fortunate enough to grow up in a big fishing family. Now, I stepped right. it up a notch or two, but I mean, just catching – you know, crappie and perch and, and, and white bass. And we ate a lot of bass growing up. You know, we didn't know the difference between them. We were just out there trying to catch a little dinner. And so, uh, you know, there's been a lot of generations of, of uh, just fishermen in my family. So I was fortunate to grow up around that. And then I kind of took off running with it on the ground, trying to be, you know, a professional angler in the bass fishing world. So it's been a lot of fun. When you think back to doing those tournaments when you were, 
12, 13, 14 years old, what are some of the things that stick out to you that you remember from fishing tournaments as a kid? I'll guarantee you there's no bigger memory than I have of hooking one about four or five pounds and losing him. He got me hung up in a bush and a little willow tree buck bush. We were flipping shallow and, and I just wasn't big enough to get him out of it's what it amounted to. And he was, he had more gumption than I did. And, and I lost him. And I think that was probably the worst thing that could have happened because all it did was fuel the fire. And all I wanted to do was catch another one. And, you know, I think my dad took me to that tournament at 12 years old, just to kind of shut me up. Little did he know it was just going to throw gas on the fire. As you got a little bit older, I, I don't know if it was a thing back then. I'm not sure how old you were, but um, was, you know, was there high school fishing teams or, or college fishing, anything like that that you were able to get involved in? No, I wish there would have been. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, benefits, you know, to that these days. But no, you know, just pretty much we fished some Friday nighters and some things that were cheap and that we could afford. And mm -hmm. uh, my dad really wasn't a tournament angler. My uncle was a little bit of a tournament angler. He tried to fish some larger team events around home and, uh, you know, different things like that. And so he tried to give me a little bit of advice. But but really, you know, it re wasn't until I got a little older and, and started working in a cheese factory that I met a guy named Joe Wagner. And uh, he kind of took me and showed me the avenues of, of tournament angling at a little bit higher level. And and uh, it definitely hooked me out there for sure. So, But I, I owe a lot of this, whether good or bad, to him so um okay so you know thinking back to what that guy was teaching you and kind of showing you the ins and out of tournament fishermen or being a tournament fisherman i'm sure some of the stuff that he was talking to you about was getting sponsorships um what what do you remember about the very first fishing related sponsorship you were you were ever able to secure who was it and you know what do you what do you recall you know, one of the ones that really sticks out to me was uh, Jim Cunningham, and he had Winchester jigs. They were a really tiny finesse jig. jig Jim wanted to make the market really, really tiny uh, with a profile so small that uh, it was an Ozark staple. We had a finesse jig, but Jim was going to make it 30% smaller and uh, really, really like key on Kentuckys and... Uh, it just was going to be a big player as far as getting bites and being able to compete. And uh, I got with John Butler at Southtown Sporting Goods in Joplin, Missouri, and I got him introduced over there and everything. And I had a lot of success on him around home because it was downsized just a little bit smaller than like an Eakins uh, finesse jig. And so uh, that's one of the first sponsorship I ever had. I'm still friends with Jim to this day. And uh, it was a great product and a great time to have it and everything. So, but uh, just kind of helped me cut my teeth a little bit. For sure. For sure. So, like I said, I know nothing about Sarcoxy. I was looking it up on the map uh, and, and kind of trying to figure out what your like home lake would be down there. Is it Stockton? Or yeah, what it's is definitely what? Stockton. Yeah, yeah oh. it's definitely Stockton. But now since... Since then, as I got a little older, I probably fish Grand more than I do Stockton. They have some okay. larger events there, and so we've kind of trickled down that away. Gotcha. Now, I've I've personally never fished at at either of those. It looks like Stockton is about an hour and a half north of Sarcoxy. For anybody who, uh, you know, can can kind of visualize that on the map, um, you know, what are what are some of the things that you you enjoy particularly about those two lakes? Well, there's a lot of differences, you know. I'm really about an hour from Table Rock, an hour from Grand, and an hour from Stockton. So if we chose to go somewhere, it really wasn't too hard to get to any of them. But, you know, Grand's really populated. Table Rock uh, has a lot of deep, clear water. And Stockton's just kind of what I consider a shallow fishery. There's no building around the lake. And uh, it doesn't have quite as much pressure as like Grand Lake. Now, today, it seems like all the lakes have a ton of pressure. But in the day, it didn't have that much. So we went up there to try to get away from like boat traffic and things like that. So it, it, it was just three different, totally different fisheries. Of those, 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 those that we're talking about, Table Rock, Grand, and um, what was the other one we said? Stockton. Yeah. Which, which do you believe holds the biggest bass? Well, I don't know. I, you know, that's a good question. You know, they've been stalking 
maybe seven, eight years ago, they stocked some F1s and some Florida strains in Grand. I'm going to say Table Rock probably has the biggest bass. You know, I, I've caught a 10-pounder. I've caught a pair of 10-pounders out of there. And I think there's just a, there's just an avenue for fish that never get any pressure. Now, will you ever catch one that weighs 12 or 13? Probably not. He'll probably never come to the bank where you could catch him or even the chance of lucking into him. But I don't think Stockton really has the gene pool to produce that kind of fish like Table Rock does. So out of the three, Grand might catch up one of these days, but I'm going to say Table Rock's probably your best bet to catch a true giant in Missouri. Um, something I, I talked with Marcus Sakura about when he was a guest on the show, he's a Lake of the Ozarks guy. And I asked yeah. him, what do you think the, the currently right now, the largest largemouth bass in that body of water is, and I'm going to ask you the same thing. What do you think the biggest bass in Lake of the Ozarks right now is? Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I know they, they catch a nine pounder every now and again and lick around on 10, but, uh, I don't know that if, I don't know that a fish can live long enough and keep enough weight on in our kind of uh, water temperatures to absolutely have a chance to gain into that 12, 13, 14 pound range. It, I just don't think our growing season is long enough. I think they exert too much energy trying to catch forage. And so, you know, any place you go in the country, you catch a 10 pounder, that's a bona fide good one. So I, I would say, you know, that 10, 11 pound range would have to about kill it at Lake the Ozarks due to the climate and the, and the area of the, of the U S that we live in. That's what Marcus said. He, he thought high tens. He said, I'm going to guess yeah. 10, seven. Um, so it, it seems like you, you kind of think the same thing. Um, I, I, I don't know how much you know about, you know, fish biology, probably a lot more than I do, but how old does a fish have to be typically to get 10 pounds of bass? Boy, I tell you what, I really don't know. You know, I know up north, like if you catch a five pounder in the state of Wisconsin, you know, it's probably 10 years old. Where I think if you catch a five pounder here in Missouri, it's probably around seven, you know, maybe eight, depending on the amount of forage in the lake and what kind of conditions you're under. But they definitely have a longer growth season, so they gain more weight the further you go south. And so uh, we're probably in that middle of the road, you know, area to where, uh, you know, I'd say a fish that weighs 10 pounds is probably definitely mm, over 10 years old. I don't think one can grow 10 pounds in 10 years. And that's why it's really important to kind of take care of some of these bigger fish in a tournament situation, those six, seven, eight pounders, because it just takes them a long time to get there. Yeah, it's so rare. Um, what are your, let's say, you know, your, your, favorite two months out of the year here in Missouri to fish for, for me personally, I'm April, May, right before the spawn. And when the spawn gets going, that's when I can just go out there and catch, you know, 10 plus fish an hour. And that's the way I like to fish, um, for you. What, well, what I'm going to mix that up. I'm going to mix that up a little bit. I'm going to say like the middle of March right there, those last two weeks of March, first mm -hmm. two weeks of April, when the big ones really are coming up on the bank and are showing themselves they're as healthy as they're going to be all year. And there's a lot of numbers mixed in there as well. And then I'm going to go the other way and say that first week of June, second week of June. Uh, so maybe the, the third week of May to the third week of June, when all those fish are really getting back offshore and getting congregated and, and they're feeding up, they're not going to weigh as much. So there, that's probably my second choice, you know, cause that first, that first um, time frame that I mentioned is when they're going to weigh the most and you have a chance okay. to catch a true giant. But numbers are really, really good in Missouri, you know, in that June time frame. But you just got to be careful and take care of them because they're really stressed and they, uh, they're they not as hardy as they are in March. So, But those are my two windows. I wouldn't want to say two months back to back. I think those, those two windows in between are probably my favorite. Very cool. Um, so this episode is is our early July episode. It's a, a time when, you know, a lot of these lakes that we're talking about are seeing probably more boat traffic than, and, and, you know, fishing pressure than they see at any other time of the year. We're heading into 4th of July weekend here. What are some tips that you can offer for the people like myself who are going to be making their way down to Lake of the Ozarks or any of these other bodies of water on such a busy weekend to uh you know have a little more success 
Well, I'll tell you what, get out there early. You know, don't party it up at night and, and stay up all night and then try to get up. You know, get out there. I mean, it's getting daylight now at 530 for sure. You know, you can get out there and fish till 9 o'clock before the boat traffic gets out. Really have some great days. And then I'll tell you what, a lot of times as a tournament angler, I watch out for this because in the evening times, you get this window of false advertisement from the fish. And they'll set up on these little old places that are really good and you can catch them. But the tournament's only from, say, 6 to 2, but they only sit there from 5 to dark. And uh-huh. you can graph them, and they really chew good, and they bite. And it's fun, but it doesn't pay off on game day. So, really, <laughs> those those afternoon line fish are really fun to go catch, like 4th of July when you just want to go have fun. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's okay, so you have fished a lot of different lakes in your career doing the tournaments. Which do you find to be, and this can be more than one, which lakes do you find to be the most challenging for you personally and why? I, I think probably, I think probably like grass lakes. I mean, I really like them. I enjoy grass lakes, but mm-hmm. if a lake has grass in it somewhere, it's probably got grass in it everywhere. And it just kind of spreads the fish out. And you got no difference between types of grass and good grass and what stage the grass is in. And I mean, I saw Ter- Todd Faircloth one time put some in his mouth. I'm like, what in the world is that? You know, is he trying to taste it? And, and, and he just wanted to see what kind of taste it had to it because the fact that if it was bitter or dying and I was like, my gosh, I'm way behind this deal. So probably those grass lakes because the guy that knows those grass lakes, they really can tell just by looking down there or, or hooking the grass with something and pulling it up and looking at it how good that grass is. And I, I just kind of know that there's good green grass there. And so I have to fish a lot more. So that's kind of a little bit intimidating probably for me. Okay. So uh, again, this is kind of a, is this accurate deal? According to, uh, you know, the internet, when you <clears throat> research Jeremy lawyer, it says uh, your current winnings to date in your FLW MLF career are roughly $926,000. That's that's yeah. spread out over, you know, about a 20 year career, but that's still uh, wildly impressive. You've scored wins over $90,000 <clears> throat> a couple of times. Um, so that is, that, is, that is pretty wild. Have you, do you know, have you hit the million dollar in winning range yet? No, I mean, I mean, I've won a million dollars, no doubt. If you counted all my tournament careers through all the circuits, but no, I tell you what, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of that. I didn't foresee that coming. I really didn't even keep track of it till my dad asked me about it about a year ago and he wanted to know what that number meant. And so I explained it to him, but you know, really just, just, uh, you know, I've just been fortunate to have have fishing kind of go one-on-one with me and everything worked out, and I've been blessed with some great sponsors and had some success. You know, when I won the All-American in 2016, all I wanted to do was say I did it one year. I won the bucket list. I'm going to go fish the FLW Tour. I've watched it all these years growing up. I want to go say I did that. And then to have some success and even win an event – wasn't even on the radar at that time. So no, it's been a blessing for me and my family. And, you know, fishing's really been a part of, you know, my marriage and my, my daughter growing up and everything like that. We just, we're just kind of one great big fishing family. And, and uh, some of us been bad, a lot of it's been great. And so uh, I try to help, you know, kids and pass it along all I can, but, but no doubt it really didn't set out to be something like that. It was just something that I want to say I did and did not expect to have, that kind of success, you know, I just didn't want to go broke trying to do it. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's impressive. I, I would assume most professional fishermen don't hit that million dollar, you know, lifetime winnings. Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of with that in mind, I mean, you're, you're somebody who's obviously been able to, to make it work when it counts, you know, on those tournament days, what, what are some things that you think kind of separate let's say that top 10 to 15% of guys who were out there as professional tournament fishermen from the rest of the pack. I'll tell you what I think helped me probably more than anything, especially at this level. I didn't really prepare it this way, but I didn't get much help going up through the tiers of fishing through the BFLs, through the Everstart series and the Toyota series now, and then the FLW tour and all that. I just, I just wasn't a guy that knew a lot of people 
I didn't, I just didn't really get in. I didn't have a big social media following. I just loved to fish. We grew up on the creeks and everything like that. So I kind of had to just learn it from the school of hard, hard knocks, you know, and I tried to just uh, go out there and catch all I could all the time. Well, then as I got a little older and I, I kind of gained a little bit more and I gained another tier and another tier, and then I won the All-American, I got a chance to fish the tour. Um, I, I just kind of kept applying all that. I didn't ask for a lot of help because I didn't have a lot of help. And it, and it seemed like it helped me learn better, even when I got beat really bad. I mean, got my teeth kicked in. I still learned something from it because the fact that somebody didn't give me a waypoint or somebody didn't give me just a, a, a bank or something like that. Now, I don't want to say that I've never got that. I want to say it's never worked out. But probably less than 10% of the time has it even ever applied to any place we've ever went. And so I think probably something like that. So when I talk to high school groups and – and young people that's wanting to make a career out of it, I try to explain to them that if you learn yourself rather than somebody trying to just give you something or, and spoon feed you, you're going to go a lot further in the sport because now we've got all kinds of rules. You can't get information, you know, and then once it goes, the schedule comes out, it's off limits. So, but I think trying to kind of just do it on my own, not that I really planned it that way. It's just kind of how it worked out. Mm -hmm. That's probably been one of the staples that's helped me have a little bit of longevity in the sport do the fact that I wasn't dependent on somebody. How much has electronics changed? Oh man. Well, I'll tell you what, if they, if they do away with Garmin, if they do away with Garmin live scope, I'm going to quit. I mean, it, it really has taken what's kind of sad about it. If somebody, let's just use Kevin Van Dam, for instance, he learned maybe with a compass, maybe with whatever means he had just obviously 2d sonar, uh, and, and GPS units that definitely did not show contours like today where these fish set up. And then in order to actually catch them, you just had to put your troll motor down and go on a ledge uh, for maybe a mile. Now we can just idle it and see it, especially once you see it one time. And then with Garmin LiveScope, if they're not set up right, and I throw three or four casts, I just pull the troll motor and go on. We might have spent two hours there before trying to get them to bite. And so uh, – no doubt that's allowed me to catch up with Kevin Van Dam a lot quicker. And that's that's kind of bad for Kevin Van Dam just because he's got so many years of knowledge that it took him to learn that. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of the way it is, and that's just how, how it's all kind of come together. But technology has played a tremendous role. And the guys that have embraced it have, have actually made hay with it, and the guys that have been kind of scared by it and said, I'll just – fish the way I have for years, they're way behind. So this young generation really needs to embrace that technology because just like a smart phone, the flip phone and all that, it's, it's going in that direction and it's going to continue to. That's interesting. So if you're able to figure out the technology, really anybody has a fighting chance. It definitely makes your odds a lot better. There's no doubt about it because when you pull up on a place and you mark some fish, you can tell in just a few casts, maybe if they're not even bass. Now it's hard to kind of tell sometimes on down and clear view that it's it's bass or catfish or suckers. It depends on where you're at in the world. But uh, when you put that live scope down and you you throw a a big spro crankbait through them or whatever, and they don't do anything or they just absolutely run off to the hilt, they're probably not bass. You know, so you can just kind of tell that quick. Where before. You just had to really just fish for them, and it, it's changed the game, no no doubt about it. But, you know, used to, you had to crank your windows up on your truck. You know, we used to ride horses. I mean, there's just a lot of things that everybody used to do, so it's just going to go in this way and keep taking the appropriate steps to move forward. Okay, so now I'm going to see if you can give me personally some tips for this weekend. I'm a St. Louis guy, and like so many other people around the Midwest, I am heading to Lake of the Ozarks in a couple of days, and I'll be down there for four days doing a little fishing. We're staying uh, Airbnb on the water in a little cove, and we've got some kayaks. If this is you out there fishing, uh, what, do you, what are the first things you are looking for? What are you targeting? Well, I'll tell you what. If I was going to fish out of a kayak, I would look and see what the water level is. The water level has been up pretty good. I've been up there the last two weeks catching them, and, and just because the fact that it's one of the hottest lakes in the country right now, and I, I just want to learn from bass fishing and everything too, so I'm up there catching them. Normally, we never have tournaments now, but 
but uh, I'm, I'm just up there trying to learn too. The water level's been really high. There's been a lot of willow, water willow in the water, and uh, them fish have wanted to be shallow in that. And there's kind of two groups of fish. If I was going to fish out of a kayak, I'd, I'd find the back of a creek, someplace that was really flat, had a lot of that water willow, and, uh, you know, throw a snag proof frog, throw a scum frog, throw a spro frog. I mean, just throw a frog a bunch around to that because for two things, frogs are going to catch you begging. The fish right now are shallow and it's hot and they're looking up at perch because most of them perch are three or four inches under the water. They're not down very low. And then that, that frog just gives a good profile off and it comes through that water willow really good and it just gives them something to key in on. And then you got two, another group of fish that's out. They're pulling water through the lake constantly out of Truman and through table or through Lake of the Ozarks, 100% around the clock. Now, they're not pulling as many gates. They may just pull three gates in the morning and five gates in the evening, depending on the temperature and everybody running their air conditioner. But then there's a deep bite out there with those. You know, you can go out there with a Zoom swimmer. You can go out there with a big football jig, you know, freedom structure jigs, and, and just drag around a big old monster worm. I mean, there's just a ton of fish out there setting on any kind of current break or any place where the current runs over. There's a lot of them, you know, a third of the way in the creeks from the main lake side setting on brush and structure. But when you're in a kayak, that group of fish is probably going to be hard uh, to, to concentrate on, especially after, say, 9, 30, 10 o'clock with the boat traffic. But mm -hmm. if you right. want to say say the perfect storm of being a kayak, go out there and drag around on some of the points, the, the ones that definitely are getting hit by the current. And you just look at the creek channel, how it's coming down the lake, and whichever ones are kind of being hit, there's a good chance there's going to be some fish on those. And then as the boat traffic comes out, pull out that frog and move towards the back of the creeks and flip a jig around those last three or four boat docks in the pockets and fish that water willow that's going to be around them. And I, I mean, it's it's been a really good deal. And I will say the biggest ones have been out there on that main stretch on the main lake. But numbers-wise, there's been a lot of them back in the creeks, super shallow, feeding on brim. You know, we had a full moon here just a week ago or so. There was a lot of fish up there feeding on those. Now, that's kind of going away. You're, you're going to lose brim beds for a few weeks or two weeks now until it goes to a new moon. But you're uh, you definitely got a lot, two groups of fish. And with a kayak, you're probably better off to, to target the shallow ones. Okay. Um, so for anybody else heading down there doing the same thing I'm doing this weekend, um, you can stop and – Walmart and look for these displays you see behind me, the Tackle HD displays. There's two different ones. One of them carries our uh, Helgramite, both the five inch version and the three and a half inch version. The other one carries our high def craw. Um, great baits to get out there and bounce around this weekend. Um, you can find these in 120 Walmart locations from mid Missouri, probably around Sarcoxy all the way down through Arkansas. And of course you can find stuff on our website, which you see down below tac uh, tacklehd.com. But make sure you pick up some of those baits. Uh, we're here with Jeremy Law Lawyer today. Uh, JeremyLawyerFishing.com is your website. Before I let you go, I, I have been following you for a little while on social media and you seem to be very active on there. And that's a big piece of, you know, being a professional angler these days is the social media part and the content creation. Is that something you're into or is that more of like a necessary evil that you're getting uh, put up to by sponsors and stuff like that these days? No, I enjoy doing it, you know. I mean, I, we, we try to do a little bit of everything. You know, I show some crappie fishing and some cat fishing and bass fishing. I mean, we, we get into turkey hunting and deer hunting. I mean, I just like to showcase it all, you know. One of my biggest partners is Bass Pro Shop, you know. They're great big in the outdoors. I'm great big in the outdoors. You know, I love to trap. And so, uh, I mean, we did, we just get out there and try and showcase a bunch of stuff, you know. Um, it's, just a, it's just a fun way to kind of watch what everybody else is doing, and they can follow you and see what you're doing. And, you know, I'm no different than anybody else. I just want to get out there and have a good time, catch as much as I can. And, uh, you know, we're going to eat some, we're going to throw some back and, and just have a good time in the end. You're still a very young guy. What are some things that you would still like to accomplish in the world of fishing, let's say in the next five to 10 years? You know, i tell you what, uh, really, I, I, one of my biggest goals is to make it 10 more years. You know, you don't see a lot of of Larry Nixon, Jimmy Houston, Bill Dance type careers anymore because this this sport will kind of get you upside down in a hurry 
and it just kind of chews you up and spits you out. And so one of the main focuses I have is that I just want to make sure that I have the mind focus that I want to have some longevity in it. I want to pass around, you know, some of the things that I've experienced to young people, try and help them a little bit, whether it's good, bad, or the ugly, you know, uh, everybody says that you should try and win every event. You should want to, you should want to do all these different goals. You know, I kind of don't want to say that I'm satisfied with the sport whatsoever, but I'm just trying to keep from, trying to leapfrog out in front of it and soak in what's going on right now. Because one of these days I'm going to look back and say, what happened? I was too busy worried about what's going on out there. And I don't, I don't want to do that. So, you know, I try to take a bunch of kids fishing, you know, and just do, just do some different things. So I don't know if I have one goal other than just somehow keep, keep trying to get around the sport and continue to be competitive and uh, hopefully help somebody else along the lines as they try to come up. I have seen some of your posts on Instagram where uh, you're out there with some of those young anglers, some of those high school age guys who take it very seriously. And just a couple of days ago, I don't know his name, uh, but you posted a video. I think you were down at the Lake of the Ozarks and it was this kid that I've had a couple of uh, conversations with at Dunn's. In yeah, Italy. Quentin Harper. Quentin What's Hopper. That? Quentin Hopper. Quentin Hopper. Yeah, Quentin. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've talked to him in there. I was getting uh, some line put on yeah. and, and we talked for a little bit. I told him I was uh, doing this. So, Quentin, if you're out there, what's going on, man? Uh, and everybody over at Dunn's, they, Dunn's carries Tackle HD. They've got a lot of our product, too. So we appreciate that. But uh, yeah, he's yeah, a he, young. You know, he knew his stuff. He was. He was a young angler that's very. Uh, you know, excited about the sport and wants to get his chance one of these days. And so, uh, but you could tell by his posture and that's the first time I'd ever been in the boat with him, but he, he was well on his way to uh, doing everything that he needed to do. If he can just keep uh, focus on what's at hand as he moves forward, you know, so many of these kids think that you're going to get out of school or college and you're going to get uh, a brand new boat and a brand new truck and a brand new house and sponsors are going to give you a fistful of hundreds and you're just going to go catch bass. And I just try to explain to them, it's just not really like that, you know, and, and uh, hopefully some of my experiences will help them down the road and, and life's going to catch up with them at some point. But uh, you know, it's really neat to be in the boat with a young man that's, you know, 20 years younger than you or better 25 and to see the passion he's got for the sport and just kind of reminds you, remember how you, how you really thought about the sport back in the day when, you know, at one point I was really green and had no idea how it all went down. Well, we appreciate you uh, doing that and, you know, spreading your love of the outdoors for anybody watching. I, I highly suggest that you follow along with Jeremy's journeys. He's on um, Instagram, uh, Facebook, your website is jeremylawyerfishing.com uh, Jeremy, thank you so much for being on the show, man, and, and I wish you all the best and everything to come in your career. Well, I appreciate it. No, it's a good time. Yeah, anybody can follow me on Instagram or Facebook. Anything that says Jeremy Lawyer Fishing, I'm pretty well associated with it, but yeah, so I, I appreciate it. Anytime, let's talk some more fishing.